Welcome, I'm Sarah White, a retired director of pharmacy. I hope this conversation stimulates you to think about how to continue to evolve our pharmacy services on behalf of our patients. Remember, every pharmacist needs to be a little L leader on their shift or in their practice. While each person's career evolves in a different way, what you'll find as a baseline is them making and seizing opportunities. By way of a brief introduction, Bill Ellis received his undergraduate pharmacy degree from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Sciences, a Master's of Science in Health Education from St. Joseph's University, and completed the executive residency at ASHP. He has held several leadership positions, beginning with being the Executive Vice President for the Pennsylvania Society of Health System Pharmacists, Executive Director, Center for Proper Medication Use, Director, Quality Center, American Pharmacists Association, CEO and Executive Director, APHA's Foundation, and is currently the Executive Director, BPS, the Board of Pharmacy Specialties. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Let's begin with BPS. Why don't you trace its development and evolution? Well, the beginning of BPS, or the Board of Pharmacy Specialties, and actually specialties in pharmacy, goes back to some work even in the, in the mid-60s. Um, Paul Parker was beginning to write about the evolution of hospital practice and began to identify that pharmacists were working in, in specialized um, areas. So in 1971, uh, the American Pharmacist Association House of Delegates passed a resolution that called for APHA to study specialization um, in the profession of pharmacy. And so a task force was put together, the APHA Task Force on Specialization in Pharmacy, uh, in 1973. And that group deliberated um, for about a year, published their report in 1974, and they concluded that the profession of pharmacy should have uh, a body, an independent body, to uh, be able to deal with the issue of specialization, set standards, award those credentials. The group didn't go as far as to say what those specialties should be, but that the profession should have a way to board certified, uh, board certified pharmacists in, in specialty areas. Um, you know, it was also, while that was going on in the early 70s, um, there was also this groundswell in consideration of specialties. Um, Don Frankie had been writing about this, and the Millis Commission report um, by the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacies also began to identify that there was differentiation in pharmacy practice. So a, th a lot of things really coalesced together um, at, that, at that point that led to um, the, uh, the formation of the Board of Pharmacy Specialties in 1976. You know, one of the things that's it's important, Sarah, to talk about here, because it's held true um, even today, is that when that task force set about its work, uh, it gathered input from across the professions, uh, various organizations, um, and it also sought input from outside of pharmacy, medicine and nursing, and to this day, uh, BPS really believes in that philosophical approach to our work and we try very much to work across um, the major professional organizations and specialty societies in pharmacy and routinely draw um, input from medicine and nursing. So we actually have two positions on our board of directors. One is designated for a nursing representative and the other is designated for a, a representative from medicine. So those very principles back in the 70s still hold true today and I, I think have served as well. So what were the first specialties? So the very first specialty to be recognized was nuclear pharmacy. So that was recognized in 1978 and it made sense at the time. There was a section, you know, APHA had just completed the work of this task force. There was a nuclear pharmacist section within APHA um, that coalesced around 1975. And um, there was general consensus um, across pharmacy that nuclear pharmacy was a unique and specialized area, it required specialized training and skills in dealing with those products and issues related to safety. So that was sort of a natural um, for BPS uh, to do that and recognize that first specialty in, in 1978. Um, 
there was about 10 years before the next specialties were, were recognized. Um, the next two specialties, both recognized in 1988, um, Nutrition Support Pharmacy, uh, which was created uh, through a petition uh, from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, then Hospital Pharmacists, and um, ASPEN, the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Also um, in 1988, BPS recognized pharmacotherapy uh, based on a petition from the American College of Clinical Pharmacy. So, 10-year uh, gap and then two specialties. Um, and pharmacotherapy today has gone on to become the largest specialty within the BPS um, structure with almost 75% of the board-certified pharmacists holding um, the pharmacotherapy uh, certification. So, once there is a petition, then what all happens around that? So BPS is believe that, um, and again, true to our roots, that specialties need to be recognized from the ground up. And so the BPS board, though we have the um, final decision on whether a specialty is recognized or not, um, responds to petitions from the profession to recognize a specialty area. So we don't separate out and make that decision on our own. It has to come up or organically from, from the profession. And there were seven um, criteria that were identified as part of that original task force in 1974 that have pretty much held true 40 years later today. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me when I go back and I read that task force, um, the tremendous amount of insight and vision that those individuals had um, in, in doing that. Um, some folks are on that task force. Lloyd Parks was the chair. Um, John Gans was part of that uh, task force, Warren Weaver. So. Um, that group did, did tremendous work. And those criteria still have held up today. And so the, there's roughly seven criteria and they relate to um, need for the proposed specialty area, demand, um, and then each specialty has to have um, a unique body of knowledge that represents the specialty. They have to have unique activities. What kinds of things are those specialists doing that are different um, than, than general practice? And then uh, we look at some other criteria. How are specialists trained? Um, so how does the specialty ultimately propagate itself and continue to grow? And are there standards? And is there consistency among that, among that training? Um, then we look at things like transmission of knowledge. So can we go to the literature and see that there are routine publications and lectures and scholarly work and research around the particular specialty area? So they're the criteria that we generally look at. And so an organization that petitions BPS has to address each of those criteria and make the case that this proposed specialty area um, is, meets all of those, all of those areas. So, and so that is, involves quite a bit of work. Um, uh, usually some kind of analysis, maybe meta-analysis of the literature. Um, probably also involves some initial or, or new research, usually survey work. Um, and the other thing that it involves, which is key to specialties, is conducting what's called a role delineation study or a job task analysis. And this is where a group of subject matter experts in the proposed specialty area get together and debate and discuss sort of what would that specialist job description look like, a complete job description, and what is in their purview and what's not in their purview. And that is really uh, a critical step in a valid specialty certification examination. And so that process is conducted, subject matter experts design the content outline, and then uh, it's validated by surveying pharmacists to practice in the proposed specialty area to see, yes, this is what I do, or no, this is what I don't do. And so the final result of that really results in a content outline um, for the specialty area. And so it's based on all of that information that BPS makes its decision. And we, we've consistently always held open hearings um, for any new specialty, so we get input from the profession itself. We do seek input from those outside of the profession, colleagues in medicine, nursing, employers, hospital administrators, educators, to try to validate um, the, the specialty. So it's a, it's a pretty extensive um, process. The average petition probably is somewhere in the range of 450 to 600 pages when it's all said and done. So it's a very complete, exhaustive process. So once it's approved, what happens then? 
So the process takes, well, the role delineation study takes about a year to conduct uh, the role delineation or job analysis. Um, BPS typically in our old bylaws allowed up to a year to um, analyze and make a decision on those. And in 2012, our board um, shrunk that timeline to six months uh, so that we have a quicker turnaround on those things. And then um, once the specialty is approved, then BPS, and this was in the original 1974 task force report, appoints a specialty council of nine members that essentially governs that specialty. Um, so then there's the process for the call for um, members to serve as that initial specialty council. Um, we have nine members on our specialty council, and um, six of whom, once a specialty is mature and we've been given the exam, has six members who are board certified in that specialty. And then there are three other pharmacists on that nine member council who are not board certified. Obviously, in a new specialty, no one is board certified, but they are subject matter experts in, in, in that area. And that's, you know, as we sit here in 2013, that's exactly where we are today as it relates to pediatrics and critical care, which are the two most recent specialties approved by BPS. So once that task force is convened, um, they have to decide on what the eligibility criteria are going to be for the examination. Um, they have to decide what the recertification criteria are going to be. And then they have a huge job in terms of putting together the item bank to begin to test uh, individuals and, and think about awarding certification in, in the specialty area. And the testing is done with outside resources as well, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a collaboration. So BPS is responsible for building the item bank of valid test questions. And the item bank of test questions is mapped to the content outline. So based on that role delineation study, there's usually three to five domains per specialty. And we tell candidates, and it's publicly available on our website, that X percent of this exam is going to come from domain one, X percent from domain two. So it's, it's, it's mapped. And the development of exam questions needs to, um, needs to mirror that. But we do contract with outside um, help and support to administer um, the exam. We use psychometric consultants, so that helps make sure the exam is valid and legally defensible. So these are individuals, PhD trained, um, that study the, the construct of examinations, proper questions, making sure they're fair, they're not biased, um, that they really also discern uh, the knowledge level of the, uh, of the individual. So it's a very rigorous process, and so we do contract for outside help. And then the other piece is the actual administration of the exam at testing centers, and so there's an infrastructure of testing centers out there. We contract um, to make sure that those um, exam sites are available and accessible to candidates who want to test. How has the growth in accountability in healthcare influenced uh, accreditation and certification in your view? Oh, I, I think that's been a big, big driver in healthcare. Um, folks are looking for purchasers, be they consumer purchasers or the government or um, other employers are looking for accountability uh, in the delivery of healthcare. And they're looking for some level of assurance that the services um, that they are purchasing are of sufficient quality. So that's been a general backdrop, I believe, in healthcare. We are really in the era of accountability. I don't think that's gonna change. I only think that's gonna continue to be ratcheted up. And so the timing of that, um, I think, worked out very well for BPS. So there's been this natural growth in board certification, and um, we've seen a lot of trends, particularly on the employer side, related to requiring board certification. And that's also been underpinned not only by employers, which is very important, but we, we've seen that reflected in the policy of many major national pharmacy organizations who have gone on record saying that pharmacists that are practicing at advanced levels and dealing with complex drug therapy issues should consider or should be um, board certified. So a lot of this is kind of coalesced at, at the same time, probably starting, I guess, in the, you know, the mid-90s. Um, continuing through today, and, and we don't really see that changing uh, at all. So talk a little bit about the recertification process, because you need to maintain, if I understand it correctly, your board certification. Well, that's right. Um, so the certification is not a one-time 
um, certification. You know, the other thing too, I want to back up a little bit because this is important for folks to understand about our board certification process. Everyone focuses on the examination and that is critical and, and they're the things that, that, that people really do think about, but our process to become board certified initially is a multi-step process. So first, you have to make sure you've graduated from an accredited college of pharmacy. Um, you have to have a valid license to practice. Um, but beyond that, and this is the piece that sometimes gets lost, um, you have to have a certain number of years experience in the specialty area where you're practicing at least 50% of your time or more in the specialty area to be eligible to sit for the exam. And that's important because when we talk to the public um, and employers, you wanna make sure that folks have the knowledge base. And the exam does a good job of testing your knowledge base, but you've gotta have the practical experience to right. apply that knowledge. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's part of the assurance that BPS certification gives the public and gives employers and other stakeholders in the healthcare system that the board certified pharmacist has both the knowledge and the experience uh, to do that. And so part of that experience um, can be tied to residency training. And that's the other thing that's sort of coalesced. Um, the fastest path to board certification eligibility, sit for the exam, is completion of either a PGY-1 or PGY-2. And that varies a little bit based on specialty, but that generally is your fastest path because those residency programs are structured and they're learning experiences and they're also accredited by the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. In fact, we only accept residencies that are accredited by ASHP for purposes of eligibility. Now, BPS also realizes that not every individual has the opportunity to um, participate in a residency. So in that case, there's an alternate path with three to four years of actual practice experience that you can meet that practice eligibility criteria. So that, that's the process that gets you there. So once you've gone through that and you've passed the examination, now it's important to hold out to the public and employers again that you are maintaining your knowledge base and the expertise that you've demonstrated up to this point. And so there's two paths there that individuals can use to maintain their certification. Um, the first path is that um, it's a seven year recertification cycle and an individual can sit for a recertification exam at the end of seven years. And some individuals do that. Um, it's not the majority of folks, probably 15 or 20%, but, but some individuals do choose that. The other path is to embark upon um, a series of continuing education activities uh, that are based on the content outline for the exam and are offered by organizations that BPS approves to be a provider. So all of this coursework is ACP approved, but to count for your recertification of BPS, it has to be through one of the approved um, providers that are out there and we designate one or two providers in each specialty where pharmacists can get that. Now, some folks say, well, you know, with continuing education, shouldn't everybody just recertify by exam? But again, I think what some people forget about the recertification by CE is that individuals must pass a post-test for every continuing education module, which is rigorous. Um, and so they're actually testing multiple times during their seven year cycle if they choose the continuing education um, route, because it's at a higher level than the general requirements for pharmacist continuing education. And so that gets you through that, that process of maintaining your certification over a seven year cycle. When you joined BPS in 2010, what were your immediate challenges? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I, don't, I think what we had in 2010 was um, opportunities more than we really had challenges. Um, at that point in time, this era of accountability was clearly, clearly upon us. Um, we had a lot of pent up demand um, for additional certifications. Um, we had already seen employers begin to build very formally into their um, career ladder structure, BPS certification, VA probably being primary on that list where um, pharmacists that are board certified within the VA system are eligible for pay grade increases and um, also become eligible for various clinical positions. And we've seen that in other areas of the federal government, public health service and some other areas. Um, some other uh, private sector employers like Kaiser Permanente in Denver have long been a leader. 
So all of these things were kind of going on at the same time. And so really our challenge was to begin to ramp up. Um, we had approved ambulatory care in 2009, but it had been about a decade before um, we had approved any other new specialties before ambulatory care. So how do we get there quickly, um, meet this demand, still make sure we're maintaining a high quality certification program? One of the strategic decisions um, our board made at the time was to take responsibility for conducting those role delineation studies or job, tasks, uh, job task analysis. Um, that previously had been part of the petition process, and it still is, but it was required by the petitioning organization. BPS said, why don't we do this ourselves? We can begin to jumpstart uh, the process to explore new specialties and um, help spread the cost um, to do that. And, and at the end, you could look at that role delineation study and, and probably have a pretty good idea whether a proposed specialty had a, had a good chance of being recognized um, or not. So we took that on and um, completed role delineation studies in pain and palliative care, pediatrics, critical care, cardiology, and infectious diseases within a two-year period. So it was a very aggressive timetable and recently approved pediatrics and critical care. And the other three are in various stages of, of consideration. So that, that was really the goal to kind of jumpstart that process, still work across the profession to do these things, which has been our hallmark. Um, and then there were some other things that we had to do really related to infrastructure. Um, up to that point in time, up through 2012, the BPS exam was a paper and pencil exam, and it was administered one day a year, traditionally the first Saturday in October. The demand and the requirements and even finding physical um, facilities to administer exams in quiet areas when, for example, in Baltimore, I think we had 350 people test on one Saturday. And so there was all kinds of challenges related to that. So we embarked on a process to figure out who the right partners were going to be and contract it with a new test administrator, psychometric consultant, which leads to the 2013 exam administration, which is now a computer-based examination. Um, still the same four-part multiple choice questions that the exam had been, but now administered through a computer-based platform. And then administered over a window of three weeks um, in October. So it created more flexibility for candidates, a broader range of opportunity. In 2012, we had, um, I believe we had about 85 sites where we tested globally. Um, in 2013, we're going to be at 650 sites. So this was a dramatic increase for BPS. Um, and I'm excited about the computer-based platform for a couple of reasons, too. Um, there's a consistency that's there, but it also, in the future, um, will allow us to test at some higher cognitive levels. We'll be able to use patient videos. We'll be able to use graphics, you know, all kinds of different testing that um, will uh, allow new ways to assess a practitioner's knowledge in the proposed specialty area. So that was an important infrastructure um, issue that we had to, um, to begin to, uh, to deal with. So they were some of the things early on um, that, we, uh, that we had to tackle. And again, it was really more about managing the opportunities and doing all this in a way that was reasonable and scalable so that this process would hold up over, over time. And, you know, I guess we felt a little bit of pressure because if you look back to what the founders did in 1974, they designed a process that has lasted 40 years. So we wanted to make sure that, that this process, um, any changes that we would make certainly would hold up over time or be flexible enough to account for some changes that, that could take place um, in the healthcare delivery system or in the training of pharmacists, all of those, those kinds of things. So you've referred a couple of times to your board of directors and they're sort of your boss correct? Mm -hmm. Who else sits on the board? You mentioned a nurse, a physician. So the BPS board um, is uh, comprised of five specialists. So um, we have eight specialties now. Five, of, five specialties are represented on the board and they represent board certified pharmacists. So they're not really representing the specific specialty, but they are representing the general population of board certified pharmacists. Then we have three pharmacists who sit on our board who are non-specialists. Um, so they bring a different perspective and come from different backgrounds. Um, uh, many times they're administrators or um, employers, uh, but they are pharmacists. And then we have a public member 
um, and that's that's a requirement for our accreditation that there be a member of, of the public. Um, our current uh, public member is a sociologist um, and really brings a different perspective and enriches our board discussion. And then we have the two representatives, um, one from medicine and, and one from nursing. So that, that comprises the, uh, the board. And then I serve as a non-voting member of the board. And then um, the American Pharmacist Association as a founding member has a non-voting observer who, um, who sits in. So that's our that's our board, um, our board composition. You referred to the organization that oversights BPS. Talk a little bit about that. So um, many organizations, um, you know, have accreditation, and um, you know, we see it in hospitals with joint commission. Uh, in the world of certification, where where we live, um, there's the National Commission on Certifying Agencies, NCCA. Mm -hmm. And um, this is important to BPS that our program be accredited because by being accredited, we agree to and prove that we follow best practices and standards in certification. And that accreditation is an example to the public and to other stakeholders and even to our certificates that we are following best practices in testing and awarding and maintaining um, credentials. So that's, that's very um, important to us. Each of our uh, specialties has to be individually accredited. So there's not a blanket accreditation to BPS. We have to apply for each um, specialty. So five specialties are accredited. Ambulatory care being the first exam was in 2011. We're in 2013 is just eligible this year and we just completed submission um, of our accreditation application for ambulatory care, but our goal clearly is to make sure that um, all of our programs um, are accredited uh, through NCCA. And in the future, we'll probably start to look at other accreditations too, including ISO, because uh, one of the very interesting things that's happening with board certification is our certification already is and continues to grow to be a global credential. Um, we test in 26 countries on a regular um, basis and probably somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of our applicant pool each year come from outside of the United States. So this is truly a global credential and we want to make sure we're also representing to the global community that we're meeting uh, appropriate standards for certification of pharmacists. And the Council on Credentialing in Pharmacy, who's that and what role do they play? So this is a group that formed some years ago. It's a U.S.-based group, and it represents a number of um, pharmacist organizations, um, and the membership changes a little bit over time. But the goal is to have a body that can sit back and look at the credentialing of pharmacists from the time a student enrolls and enters a college of pharmacy to when they graduate to the licensure then to other credentials that they may earn, including certificates for certificate training programs, residencies, um, all of the other kinds of training that go into that end, and certainly at, at the one end and, and at the high end, board certification. But it seems to make sense through CCP to have a forum to talk about all of those broad issues around credentialing, making sure that there's alignment amongst all of those parts and that everyone knows what other groups are doing and that there's a reasoned approach um, because it just makes sense for the profession. I mean, you know, we're a relatively small profession when you compare to medicine and nursing and there needs to be efficiency in this process. So this group, um, you know, doesn't have any real policy making authority, but we publish a series of white papers that create frameworks for individuals to think about the overall credentialing of pharmacists. So it's been very lively, um, very good discussions around that table, and one that I think benefits the profession um, because it does add some clarity and it does harmonize to some extent through those discussions um, the work that's being done as pharmacists work their way through. One of the areas we're working on now um, uh, that's I know going to be a big deal, particularly in hospitals, is um, credentialing and privileging. So, you know, we've seen privileging in medicine for sure, and to some extent in nursing. Pharmacy really, in some ways, is just sticking our toe in that pond. And um, there'll be a white paper coming out probably early 2014 that starts to talk about how the profession could think about credentialing and privileging a pharmacist, defining what those terms are. So it's a good resource um, for individual pharmacists, for pharmacy administrators, for employers to think about that. But I, I 
truly believe that in, in the not too distant future, um, we'll see pharmacists fully involved in a credentialing and, and privileging process similar to what we see in medicine as their patient care roles expand. At this point in time, approximately how many board certified pharmacists do we have? So there are 16,000 um, board certified pharmacists. And you know, the interesting thing, Sarah, about that is, is um, this number has been doubling every five years from about the mid 90s. Things got off to a little bit of a slow start in the 70s and then picked up some momentum in the 80s, then really picked up momentum. So from probably 97 on, um, the number of board certified pharmacists has doubled every five years. So we're at 16,000 now. BPS has set a goal that by 2017, we'll have 30,000 uh, board certified pharmacists. Uh, so uh, there's been quite an uptick um, uh, in that. And I think that a number will grow. It could well expand beyond that. I'm not really sure where the ceiling is gonna be. We're adding new specialties. Uh, again, the era of accountability, there'll be a need for these credentials. I'm not quite sure where that will well, where that will shake out. Um, there's been some debate in the profession. You know, are there too many specialists? You know, I, I don't know. I think the marketplace is going to decide that. When we look at our um, colleagues in medicine, it's become a requirement for reimbursement for other things. And so I think probably um, somewhere in the range of 90% of all physicians are board certified. So I, I don't know whether that's going to make sense for pharmacy. Um, uh, we don't have that crystal ball. But we'll build a process that'll scale. And then obviously the marketplace and other factors will determine whether that's 20% of the profession or 90% of the profession. Um, but if we build a model that can accommodate that, I, th I think we'll be in a good place.